Beloved brothers and sisters, we want to study the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. Oh, it's wonderful. So, want to embark on the study of the book of Genesis. And we want to apply our study um, approach of study methodology. Uh, you remember the what, the why, and the how. What, why, and how. What is about the meaning. You know, the meaning. If you understand what a subject is about, then you can ask the question, why is why? Why is about the importance? Why, why, why? What is the importance of this subject? What is the essence of it? And if you can understand the importance and the essence of anything, then you can apply it to yourself. So that's what, how. Apply to yourself, apply the principle, apply the process, the systems. So how? How is about how I can apply it. Now what I understand, the meaning of it, the essence of it, the importance of it, how I can apply it. So it is the application. So well, that we're talking about. So Genesis, the book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible often called the first book of Moses. And so Moses is the author. The author is Moses. Oh, that servant of God. Who else could have written a book like Genesis except a man who spoke with God face to face, mouth to mouth. Hallelujah. A man whom God called unto Mount Sinai and is stayed there with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And so it's very important you keep that background because there are things in Genesis that aren't uh, simple and aren't straightforward. But if you remember that it is a man like Moses who authored this, you would be able to say perhaps, there were things he didn't bother to put down. And so what has been put down, as the Bible says, we'll pray the Spirit of God gives us understanding of what has been put down for us. And so we will live by it. So Genesis is a Greek word, which means origin, source, generation, or beginning. Genesis is a, is a Greek word meaning origin, source, generation, or beginning. So uh, Genesis is about how everything came to be or everything came into existence in the beginning. In fact, the uh, Hebrew title, Hebrew title is in the beginning. And that's, as you've seen in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And see, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, there the Bible starts with in the beginning. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. So Genesis is the book of in the beginning. We could say so, how everything came to be, came into existence. As we can see there in the uh, Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is the alternative discussion on how everything was created. Uh, you can also check it out and try and test the veracity of it. Does it hold? <laughs> Does it hold? Do those theories, because they still remain theories, do they hold? And so we then want to look at the objective of our studies, having said this introduct quick introductory background. It is about the book of the beginning. So what is our objective? What is our objective? In the beginning, remember, it is about how 
everything came to be in the beginning. So including ourselves, what has, what is God's intention for me, for you, for us? as it was in the beginning. So these are the few objectives. You can note it down and also add for yourself. Number one, our objectives, to have deeper appreciation of God's unwavering love and relationship with humankind and the, and the world he has created. Deeper appreciation, to have deeper appreciation of God's unwavering love and relationship with humankind and the world he has created. Number two is to understand God's consistency in his grand plan to restore humankind to that desired state of love and relationship, that is fellowship with him. God's grand plan to restore humankind to that desired state of love and relationship that is fellowship with him. Glory be to God. And then number three is to appreciate the different dispensations and God's manifestation and power to appreciate the different dispensations and God's manifestation and power with his created world or in his created world in dealing with his created world and humankind uh, in these different dispensations. Finally, it's to apply the knowledge thereof to improve our own personal relationship, understand our purpose, a personal relationship with God and our purpose. To apply the knowledge thereof to improve our own personal relationship or uh, your own, my own, personal relationship with God and purpose. So these are our objectives. So a quick background again of Genesis, I'm doing introduction so we can get into the discussion. If you take a study Bible, a study Bible like the one I have, I'm using Thomas Nelson, end of verse references and book introduction, uh, uh, New King James Version Bible. Thomas Nelson, end of verse references and book introduction. So for every book, the Thomas Nelson Bible that I'm using has book introduction. So it gives you a summary, overview, key points about the book. So it's very good, very helpful. And I encourage you to um, make use of such Bibles as well. And it's New King James Version that I'm using. So the Bible um, that I'm using provides or uh, a guide more or less of the structure of the book of Genesis. And indeed, it makes it clear. So you could see that Gen the book of Genesis provides a very, has a clear structure, the way it is arranged and the way it is um, written. So he, the, 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 the Bible I'm using provides 11 uh, units, 11 units. I've kept those 11 units, but I've modified it uh, a bit. So these 11 units, uh, number one is history of creation, history of creation of the heavens and the earth and all that dwell therein. So you see that in Genesis chapter one and two, history of creation, Genesis chapter one and two. Number two is the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. 
I'm talking about the structure now of Genesis, right? So we can follow. So from history of creation summary, we go to the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, uh, the instruction God gave them. And then number three, we come to Noah. Noah. So, and in Noah, key thing is the destruction of the first world and the post-Noah generation, post-Noah generation. Number four, we then come to sons of Noah who took over from Noah. And then the generation of Shem, Shem, the son of Noah, S-H-E-M. And what you will see as uh, my study Bible provides is that every uh, of this unit will start with a genealogy or history, genealogy or history. So that helps you to see the structure. Um, so when it ends Noah, the next generation will start with one of the offspring that continues. Um, so that's why we have Noah, you have Shem. Now after Shem, number six is Terah. After Terah, I'm sure everybody can understand now the link. It goes to Abraham. Uh, in my study Bible, it was just Terah. From Terah, it goes to Ishmael. And I said, wow, that's a big gap. After Terah, it's really the anchor name, Abraham. So from Abraham, you have Ishmael, you have Isaac, you have Esau, you have Jacob. And that ends Genesis. So those are the 11 structures. So six is Terah, seven is Abraham, eight is Ishmael, nine is Isaac, 10 is Esau, 11 is Jacob. And you will see why I keep telling us the um, exclusivity of the law of Moses in with regards to Jesus Christ and the Abrahamic covenant. Because as we undertake this study, you will actually see that the Abrahamic covenant did not continue to Moses. Hello, it did not continue to Moses. That's why God started this specific exclusive law with Moses for the people of Israel. We will see that as we go on this study. And so Jesus Christ reconnected us to the original Abrahamic covenant, not ironic Levitical priesthood that was from Moses. Okay, so that sets the structure. Now what we're going to do today for our discussion, we want to start, we're not going to read all the books. With this structure, we're going to focus on, as you heard there, the objective. We're going to be looking at the, ultimately is for you to understand God's purpose for your life. Really, if you were to say one word about Genesis, it's really to understand God's purpose for mankind and your life, you as a person. What is God's purpose for you, for your life? That's what Genesis is about. If you cut through the clutters of all these stories and histories, it comes down to that one key thing. What is God's purpose for my life and for the world? So we're going to look at Genesis chapter, chapters 1 and 2. We'll read through, and then we'll take key discussions. But I want to just give us a summary before we get into that, so it will be fast. Summary of Genesis chapter, chapters 1 and 2, key points. Number one thing to remember when we study Genesis chapter, chapters 1 and 2 is that, number one, God created the heavens and the earth. Like I said, there are other theories, but let's test the veracity of it. There is one that talks about evolution, and you ask, how many years does it take for man since you were born, and you, 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 you were born without a tail, and you die without a tail? Um, okay, we are still alive. So let's use our grandparents, great-great-grandparents. 
yeah, there are fathers that we've seen our mothers, all the old people we have seen, they have lived and died without the tail and nothing has changed. And so you leave, you then say, what is the veracity of that? Does it hold? There are other theories, oh, things just a uh, big bang and then God will say, things just happened. But we have seen a very ordered, structured world. The way the Bible says God ordered it to be. It, the world is systematic, ordered, the rotation of the earth in its axis causes day and night, right? As we say. So, and depending on your location, the sun, your, your, your part of the world sees the sun more than other parts. You have more uh, daylight than the other people. Everything looks structured. We see the laws that operate the world, the gravitational force that plays out. Everything looks structured. And so that leaves us with a question of this scattering and uh, chaotic bang. But uh, let everybody operate in his own space. <laughs> I'm not an expert in that line. So I only just shared a little, but I try to read to hear what others are saying. But we keep seeing that God reveals a whole lot. Look at the knowledge of harnessing the photo and the photons, the power of the photons in the sun through the photoelectric cells that we call PVC, photovoltaic cells that we are now using to generate electricity, electric power. So that tells you quite a lot about what God, the, the, the order that God has put into the world. And God has given man the wisdom, the knowledge to explore this. And you and I have a role, a part to play in that exploration. Glory be to God. So number one, God created the heavens and the earth. Number two, point to remember is that God created humankind in his own image and blessed humankind. Number three, to remember is that everything God created was very good in the beginning. So God didn't create the chaos. God made the world to be in order. The world, if you read in Genesis, he did say that the world started in that state but God commanded order into the world and the world has responded and walked according to that order. But humankind uh, has helped in really bringing the disorder. The things we do, are we doing everything according to God's will and purpose, what God designed us to do in the world? We'll find out that. Uh, in fact, we're already living in that uh, space now. Global warming, that's the cry for every, uh, uh, for all of us now that we're about to self-destruct ourselves, right? By the things we do um, and there are others. So number four, God gave humankind a responsibility to turn and keep the earth, not to destroy it. So man has a responsibility to explore, to develop this earth, but not to destroy it. So those are the key points that we can summarize. I want us to bear this in mind as we read now. What does image of God mean? God gave you, God created man in his own image, as we said in point two. What does image of God mean? If we can get the understanding of this because this is the key as human beings then i believe we'll get um both genesis and the purpose of our lives clear as we continue to follow through with the scriptures so i'll pause here now
Um, I believe we've done the reading and uh, I would just perhaps ask us to just take the reading from uh, chapter two, chapter two to the end while we reference all the others. Um, okay, let's do this. Uh, somebody read Genesis chapter one from verse 26 to 31. And then a second person will read uh, Genesis chapter two from verse four. We'll just take from verse four. Uh, one person will read from verse four to verse 15, and the next person will read from verse 16 to verse 25. Okay, let's go. And keep in mind the question is, what does it mean? God created man in his own image. What does it mean? That's the key thing we want to discuss. Okay, who wants to go first? Genesis chapter one from verse 26 to 31. Please go ahead. Um, yes, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the, the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moved upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which it's, in which it's the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you, it shall be for meat, for thirsty. And so every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the earth and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Praise hey. the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so very much. Somebody else read from verse 4, chapter 2, 4. To 15. When the Lord this is the history the the of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the heavens, the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Verse 8. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the man, the, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from there, it parted and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havila, where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. Bidilium and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Idekel. It is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates, verse 15. 
And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Thank you. And next question, 16 to the end. Yes, okay, Joan, go ahead. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She called she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Praise the Lord. So, we want to discuss uh, a lot of, um, I believe there are other interesting points you bring up, but point one we want to discuss is what does image of God mean here in this study? God created man in his own image. So God created man, that's 1, 26, 27, 27 in particular. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And again, to emphasize from this, now you've seen in verse 4, he said, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. I want to see some other record account of creation that is better than this. I haven't seen, I haven't heard anything this profound. God created the heavens and the earth. If you just take your mind and begin to think about how far the sun is from the earth and how massive this whole earth is. And as I said before, the walkings of the entire universe, you come to the conclusion that only a super intelligent being, God, omnipotent one can do this. Because if it were by some man like you and I, what's your size to stay on earth and put the sun, you know, in billions of miles away? I mean the stars, rather, in billions of miles away. So that's what Genesis says. Now let's focus on the one that concerns us. God, this God, super intelligent, omnipotent being, the one that has started everything, makes us or has made us in his own image. What does it mean? Because that's the key to this whole life, brothers and sisters. If you can find your key of the image of God, that's the life. As we said there, God gave man the responsibility, and we have read it, of tending and keeping the earth. What's your part in that responsibility? Okay, please, who wants to go first? Who wants to try? Who wants to explain? What do you understand? The image of God. Or is there any other point that strikes you that you really want to discuss? Feel free. Uh, is there any other verse 
May any other thing you want to contribute about this, feel free. Please go ahead. Yes, Brassoni. Uh, yes, Pastor. Um, when the Bible says that God made man in his image, I think I can replace the word image with the word nature. That means God made man in his own nature. Yes. And if you look at it, we may ask, what, are the, uh, what is the nature of God? God is not limited. God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. God cannot be stopped by anybody. And God is, um, it, he is immortal. He's not go, God is not dying. And so you see that in the program of God. That's what he told man that if you keep my instruction, if you keep my word in the Garden of Eden, you will be like me forever. So when God disobeyed man, when man disobeyed the, God, rather. So when man disobeyed God, they now start having the problem. So the issue there is that I think uh, the image of God it has to do with the attribute of God, his own nature. He gave it into man because the Bible says that when God made man from the dust of the earth, at that point of creation of God forming man, man was inactive because he never had that spirit of God in him until God breathed into man. That was when God transferred his nature fully into man. And so when man disobeyed him, he told man that you are going to die. And when you die, you are going back to the dust. And we've been having series of theories all over the world. The one that we studied in school, the one that, that has to do with the evolution and so many other things. None of them, uh, has been able to stop the fact that man is always dying. No matter what you do, no matter your level in life, you are, you are, you are in your inventions, your discoveries. At the end of it all, every man goes back to the dust to confirm that God cannot lie and that you can never take His place. So, to summarize it, my understanding here is that God made all things, and as we see in the book of that Exodus. He said everything was made according to his own kind. And when God talks about kind here, he's talking about specification. There was no mix up in his creation. The birds are the birds. The fishes are the fishes. The human beings are the human beings. So you don't just mix up. You don't say this one was changed to this. Like you asked, you said in the introduction, we've been living all over the world. We've never seen any, uh, any change that maybe a monkey, you know, becoming a human being over the years. We've never seen one. So I think in the image of God, it simply means that God met us in his own nature. And if we keep to it, and when Christ came, you see that Christ displayed that nature of God. Christ is actually a full replica of God because he lived in the, in the nature of God. He lived and followed everything that God asked him to do, that, that we would have done. If man were to live the life that God wanted man to live from the beginning, Man would have lived the way Christ lived. Nothing stopped Christ when he came here on the earth. He walked on the waters. He, he, he stopped spirit. He did so many things. He performed so many things. And those were the things that we were supposed to do as human beings. And when he was crucified on the cross, he made a very powerful statement. He said that nobody takes his life away from him. That he only gave it out willingly just for the sake of us all. And that is our nature. That we have that internal life in Christ. So that is my understanding of that particular statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, you brought up keywords, nature, attributes, purpose. And then you summarize with Christ as the illustration of this likeness of God, this uh, image of God. Christ came and demonstrated by living that full life. And that gives us the example of what the nature means. Thank you. Okay, let's see other contributions. Is there any other con contribution, please? Let's hear. It's a Bible discussion. And this is key. We're not going to rush this one. Because as Brassoni has spoken, it's already laid a real good foundation. Nature attributes purpose. It's the image. And then 
Christ as a key illustration. Please, other, other contributions? Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you for the opportunity. That's, that's the, the one million question that they are asking and brother Sonny has, like you have said, there is nothing to add and to confirm that creating us in our own image and likeness. In fact, mm -hmm. I, 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 I am what I was thinking when you said we should read this Genesis. I'm seeing, I am saying X-ray, X-racing or evaluation of our beginning, our relationship with God. Where did we start? So I am looking at evaluation. I'm looking at the X-ray, taking X-ray of how God started it. And I saw exactly what he created me, created you. He created us in his own image and likeness. So we are a replica of God. So in my evaluation is where, where this is where we start. Where are we now? So why are we here? Therefore, retrieving these steps, you know what evaluation means, taking step by step to see what are we looking for? What, where, where are we? Where are we going to? So uh, like uh, Brother Sonny has summarized it, everything Jesus demonstrated it. So that is the, the, the unity in God's words, the consistency of God's words. I, I, that is, I say our God is awesome. Okay. That is what I think. It's amazing. Yeah. We, you know, signs, God has said it. That is what from the beginning, if you disobey me, you will become dust dust that I made you from. So kill somebody, kill anybody, leave him here. Come back, it will become dust. So all the story, all the this, we are in God's image. In fact, that is, I don't know, I'm, I, God, you are amazing, you are awesome. Thank you for this analysis, this X-ray that shows that I'm, and a child of God in God's image, a children of God, a replica of God, likeness of God. And if we leave taking these steps like we have seen, so I also see we are God, a perfect architect, a perfect planner. God could have said, everything come, at once, but it took time. We prepared this, it said it's good. This, it is good. This, it is good. So if, if, if we are like God, we should not be hurry in anything. We should take time, prepare our things, do it orderly, systematically, follow every details, just as God has done. We can see it is, when God made man, that is said, everything is very good. So I, 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 we should follow in his own image, God is a perfect planner. So as God's children, we should imitate God by being organized. God is a God of order. Orderliness should be part of us as children of God, image of God. Then like uh, Jesus represented him and we knew what he did. We've heard what he has done. So like I am saying, of my evaluation, uh, we, have, we have fallen short of what God wants from us. And that, but that doesn't take away who we are. We are still that. So I am happy that I have found out that okay, our father, from the, our reading of Exodus, even though Moses 
say, no, I cannot, I cannot. And in one of the things I wrote, he said, our God has the power to help us to do anything that he wants us to do. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you. It is not about doing anything under your own strength and determination. God has enough power to help you to do whatever it is he wants you to do. You see Christ come to die. Okay, so we see that in Christ. So I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. I feel so happy mm -hmm. that we are doing this evaluation, this X-ray analysis to see who we are who we actually are and by God's spirit, by his grace, we will regain what we have lost by uh, being hurry to do it our way rather than depending on the one who made us in his own image and likeness. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. In fact, uh, you've just taken, uh, you've, you've, you've concluded it so well, because um, following your line of discussions and focusing on or using the word evaluation, you have come to the conclusion that uh, human beings have fallen short of God's uh, image, God's expectation. Uh, given all that you have listed as the expression of that image of God. Orderliness, a perfect planner, um, one who follows every detail of what God intended, um, and Jesus Christ as a perfect example of God's image. A question then I wanted to ask was, okay, we've fallen short of God's image, God's expectation. How do we regain that image? How do we regain that image? We'll still come to that question, but you've uh, already started talking about it when you said God's Holy Spirit helps us to then uh, do what God expects of us. We'll put that on hold. So thank you very much. And let's uh, have one more contribution. And feel free if it is a question, one more contribution, and we will um, try to bring this together and then give some other questions that we will go and look at for further studies. So in the structure that I shared with us, we are now looking at the history of heaven and earth. That's where we are, chapters one and two, before we'll come and focus on the first man, Adam and Eve, and we'll continue that way. Okay. Any further contribution? Feel free, open the line, share. Okay, mine is more of a question. Yes, go oh. ahead with your question. Clearly God made, okay, thank you, sir. Clearly God created us in his image, which means that um, the direct Im implication of that statement is that we have his abilities, we have his nature, and we have the power to um, live out, even fulfill his own character as well. But now, we are in a world where um, the devil have done so much. So my question is, how was it possible that we are now living way, way, way below and far from this image of God? Was, when I was reading this scripture, a lot of the things look like they don't match. And I'm wondering why this much gap. So you're again just uh, restating what uh, Conf Sister Comfort State said. If you, if you raise the question um, to, 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 to the next level, if you raise it, 
So we're talking about evaluation. So your own evaluation as well as confirm that there is so much gap between where man is and the original plan. So we are falling short of God's expectation. We're falling short of what the image of God is. And your question is, how was this possible? But I think, again, I try to help you out of that hole of how, because you're living with a reality. You see, when you are with a reality, you can begin to either struggle around denying the reality or living with, what do I do? So how was this possible? It's the reality, that's it. On the other hand, it's the real question, what do I do to get back? Is it possible to get back? That's perhaps the other question to ask. Is it possible for man to get back? And so Jesus Christ has been pointed to be the perfect image of God, which is what we want to continue to look at. So while it is, uh, how do I put it now? Um, interesting question, yeah, interesting question. But let's, let's raise it to what really gives us action because it's still the question in the bewilderment. How is this possible? It's still a question in the bewilderment. Whereas the reality is what the evaluation tells us, all right? So what will help us is, is it possible to get back? How do we get back? So we're gonna to come to that. But very uh, the good observation, it just reemphasizes the same evaluation that uh, every one of us will come to, actually. Every time we look at this, we'll come to this evaluation, a point that indeed we can see God, we can see his plan, his intention, and we can see the gap. Question is, what do we do to close the gap? Is there any plan from God for us to close the gap? And still taking your own question a bit on the journey of understanding is how did this happen? How did this come to be? The Bible also talks about it. So we'll come to that. I hope that puts your question in context of uh, the journey and we will do that journey. So thank you very much. Your question is noted. How did we come to this? How, how, how did we get here? But more importantly is, is it possible to get back to that image? Okay, I'll give space to somebody else who may want to speak. God created us in his own image. Yes, Sister Ifoma, you're welcome. It's been a long time. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yes, Pastor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. First of all, I have a question. All right, what is your question? In Genesis 1, 27, you have where God said, reading from 26, that let us make man according to our own image, which we said is uh, you know, the character of God, the nature of God. And then we also still have um, in Genesis 2, 7, where he now formed man from the dust of the ground. So does it mean that the first one that, is recorded in Genesis 27, 127. Maybe it's the spirit of man that uh, was created. Then it was now the body that was now made in that Genesis 2 7. And another question I have is that male and female he created them because we also have a record that Eve was later taken from the rib of Adam. So that's my question. I'm a little bit confused. Oh. Excellent, excellent question. Thank you for that question. Yes, so this is, uh, um, at the beginning, I tried to give a structure. So um, again, I, I, I am using a study Bible. I again mentioned it, um, Thomas Nelson, study Bible, yeah. So what Thomas Nelson does is it gives introduction to every book and helps us understand the structure. So um, back to your question specifically, 
So the way Genesis is written is a, a very structured, let me read the way Thomas Nelson has put it. It says the literary structure of Genesis is clear and is built around 11 separate units. All but the first of, uh, all but the first, including, including the word genealogy or history in a summary phrase. Now this is what it means. So Genesis chapter one that you have seen, Eh? is a summary of the entire creation. It didn't give the details. It gave a summary of the entire creation. The one, this is how it started. God created the heavens and the earth and went on the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, and the seven. You see there, it said God rested. Then in chapter two, from that verse four, as we have read, it then gave the history, the real structure of how these things happened. And it didn't get back into the details of the daily events, but now focusing on the, you know, when it said God created male and female, it did not say how that happened. But in chapter two, he said how it happened. When he said God created the beasts, he did not say how that happened. But in chapter two, it went into the how. So the uh, verse 26 and 27 that you have seen in, is the overall summary. He created man, male, and female. In, Two, it went on to give us the detail of how it was done. It wasn't that. So you need to bring the two together and say God created man and from the rib of man formed the woman and the purpose for which he did this is what Genesis 26 and 27 say. So God created male and female, how man, woman out of the rib of man and for and bless them both and give them the responsibility as shown in Genesis 26 and 27. I, I hope that puts the perspective. Yes, Pastor. To it. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you too. Yes, and you will see this a lot of times as you go through the Bible. That's why my this study Bible has really helped me um, because it helps to give a lot of structure at times, even though it's just summary, the spirit of God helps us as well. Okay, so with that, let me, please anybody else who wants to say something and uh, because we'll come to, as some of these deeper questions that have been asked as we go into the chapter three and forward. So Bradara, to you specifically, I hope the clarification I've tried to give is uh, clear in terms of your question, but I, we have not addressed your question. We're gonna address because your question now takes us to chapter three forward. How did this happen? It's the story of, uh, um, Adam, the first man and first woman, the devil, as you also mentioned, and all that. And we will take it on from there. But for today, we want to, again, we want to conclude with this clarity around God's original plan in the beginning, which God has not changed from it. That's why we spend time here studying the God of new beginning. And you know how much I have fought trying to stop us using the God of a new beginning, which is talking about a different thing. It's good. God of a new beginning is a different thing from when we're talking about God of new beginning. We're saying that that original plan of God, God is always ever focusing on it. 
to bring it to fulfillment. He has not changed from it. He has not departed from it. He is continually working it to bring it. That's the God of new beginning. Okay. So I agree with everything we have shared. And I want us to just look at a few scriptures to corroborate what you have said about this God creating us in, our, in his own image. Remembering that God has given mankind a responsibility. It is man God has given responsibility to the account, the responsibility rather, God remains uh, the owner and accountability. The responsibility to tend, we've seen that God said to man, even when he put Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden, he said that they should tend. Look at verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it and brought the woman to be a helpmate so that both of them, um, I think there's something, is so that both of them can handle that responsibility. If we read verse 20, verse 20, it says, so Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to, the, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper, a helper comparable to him. A helper comparable. You see, people are struggling in the world today. Yes, because of all the injustices, we're fighting these rights and that rights and that rights. Uh, women no longer want to be women. Um, the, uh, the sexes are no more, they, it's now being attacked. All manner of confusion now in the world. But if we will return to God, we will have absolute clarity of what God intended and what will help us in the world. So here we've seen God said helper comparable. It was not helper sub, a sub helper. It wasn't helper that is inferior. It was comparable. And as an engineer, I've spoken a bit on this before, that if I were to judge, I would say without any partiality that the woman is actually an improved version of the man. And truly so. Because in engineering, when we create something, now manufacture something, the first time it is called prototype. So you can say man is a prototype. <laughs> and the next thing that we do will be the improved version because we would have understood a lot of things and learned from that prototype. And then we will make the improved version. And I'm not just joking here. So God, after making man first, created a helper comparable, a helper. A woman is loaded with every accessories, every accessory rather, that man needs to help him. <laughs> and if you come to this wisdom, this secret is good for you. If you think a woman is inferior to you, you are your own. And the day a woman deals with you, with all that man God loaded in a woman, that's the day you will know. Of course, there are some men, you hear them say, ah, you want to, especially during when some things happen, they said uh, children, a divorce and all that children are, you, know, so you want to go and struggle children with a woman. Okay, go and struggle. Now. By the time she indoctrinates the children, they become your enemy for life. No matter what you do, there's nothing to change it. And you have seen, but it is unnecessary, brothers and sisters. You see, so that's why we're studying this book. It will unearth a whole lot of things because we're going to come to topical issues that this throws up. Like the one I've just told you now, note it, we're going to come to it. 
mothers in, indoctrinating their children against the father, and also some fathers getting so, um, I don't know what word to use, not realizing the power and control that God has given to the woman over the family. And also some women don't, understand, don't know the control and power God has given to them over the family. So they abolish their responsibilities and they are chasing other things. I'm not here talking about uh, cooking in the kitchen or not cooking in the kitchen. Those are two trivial things for us to be talking about. We're really talking about that purpose of God that God has put in a family unit as a central uh, unit for the development of the world, of his purpose on earth. So there is that. So note that topic. We're going to come to it. Effective management of the family unit. So God gave the woman as a helper, comparable, not inferior, not in any way, but comparable, yet with as a helper. Your helper must have certain things that you don't have to be able to help you, isn't it? Must be given certain features, special features that you don't have to help you. So man is different from a woman. A woman is different from man. There is no way a man can be a woman or a woman can be a man. You have been deceived and lied to that it is a matter of the mind. It is not a matter of the mind. It is not a matter of you were asked to play with toys as a girl, and that's why you're feminine. There is, that's a bloody lie. Your whole makeup to fit into this world God has created is different. The makeup of the man is different. And the two, God intended to walk together to fulfill his responsibility of tending, feeling, subduing the earth and making the earth a prosperous place. But when man has left that primary duty and is focusing on fighting for woman right, man right, rather than the complementary responsibility, then we already missed the mark. Um, Brother Dara, this already starts throwing in a bit into the space of your question. So there is no doubt. That's why I was saying that we can go that route, but we are living in the reality. And rather, we probably would focus more on what do we do? What is God's expectation that we start living by that expectation? Or what are those expectations? Uh, one we can already see is that God expects a man to live as a man and take his responsibility as a man, honor the woman, and a woman to live as a woman and take her responsibility as a woman and provide the help comparable to man. It's not inferior, but use her God's given senses, wisdom, everything God has given her to play her own role as the man plays his own role. Then coming down to the individual then, individual. So we see in uh, Second Peter chapter one, uh, one want to read verses two to four. Well, let's just start reading four first. It says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through this, you may be partakers of the divine nature, divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lusts. Let's read two to four. Now, it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. 
as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, for by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers. So partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Divine is about God. So divine nature is the nature of God. So this is what we understand by the image of God that God was talking about referring to his attribute and his purpose for man. I've looked at a number of um, um, comments and write-ups on the uh, Google is your friend. And these are the ones I found consistent with what we have been saying. Uh, one says um, that the image of God, it says this doesn't refer to form. Of course, that's true. It does not refer to form, but rather humans are in the image of God in their moral, spiritual, and intellectual nature. So again, nature. So nature or likeness of God. Of course, you see that in Genesis chapter five, Genesis chapter five, if you go there, you see likeness is used. Verse 5, Genesis chapter 5, says this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He made him in the likeness of God, but not in form. Of course, we know the Bible clearly says uh, that uh, God at told the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 20, he said, do not make any form, anything. <laughs> Don't try to make anything in the likeness of anything, any image at all to represent me, okay? You, what likeness would you give to God who created the heaven and the earth? I mean, the stars as my big as they are, the sun as big as it is, the earth as big as it is. What image? How would you draw such image? So it is not in form, but here was stated so. Moral, spiritual, and intellectual nature. Um, so this refers to nature and purpose of humankind. The attributes of God. So the uh, second Peter 1, 4, we have said, said divine nature. If we look at Romans 1, 20, I think it also says something like that. Romans 1, 20. Romans 1, 20. Look at it. It says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. His invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes, are clearly manifested in the things that he has made. So there is the divine nature of God in mankind, and there is the purpose of God for man to fulfill by that nature of God in him, which a sister used the word expectation. And Jesus Christ has been our perfect illustration of this, filled with the Holy Spirit and the and, and the Bible uses the two words, image and likeness of God for him and Jesus Christ. And he came into this world and fulfilled that God's purpose, living and manifesting the full attributes of this nature of God, as God expects us also to live, to fulfill, to uh, uh, during our time and sp space here. So that's where we want to stop today and just see if there are 
there, like I said, I perceive at the end of this, maybe somebody wants to say one or two things before we pray and close. Hebrews chapter one, if we read from verse one, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, through whom also he made the worlds. Look at verse three, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So the use of image, here, it's again made clear by Jesus Christ, who came in human form in the image of God. Human form, but image of God. And that tells us that original image that indeed, as we have all discussed, isn't referring to form, but his divine nature in us, his attribute and purpose for our lives. Do you have any comment before we pray? Yes, please, go ahead. I want to also read uh, a Colossians chapter one, verse 15. It says, the son is the image of the invisible God, the first yeah. one over all creation. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, as we said, that the objective, if you miss any other thing, the objective of this study is to reawaken us to God's purpose for our lives. You as an individual, you have a purpose. I have a purpose. God has a purpose for humankind. And as we have established by the contributions from the brethren, the evaluation, either at individual level or the world level, is a wide gap. Question is, how do I, as an individual, get back to God's expectation, God's standard? What is my role in the world? to close, to bring the world to that expectation of God. This is how did the people that were gonna study in their time, dispensation as we talked about, relate and fulfill their own purpose as God intended it. So this is what we, want to explore and we are exploring and God's spirit will help us in Jesus name. We want to pray now, we want to pray. I want us all to talk to God on this very simple key point that we seem to overlook and at times we make it look so complicated. God created you, created me, created us in his image. And today we've come to hear that, and we have seen the demonstration of it in Jesus Christ, the perfect example. That's what God intended. And that's what God is intending today. How do you, who, how do you, how do I fulfill that God's intention? What is that image of God in your life? What is that image of God in my life that we must live? Let's pray. Let's ask him, the one who created us, say, Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible study, how you have helped us today, the discussions we have had, 
the contributions that have been made. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that has guided us. And now, Heavenly Father, help me understand this subject of your image, your divine nature in me, your purpose and your will for my life. Help me to understand it and guide me, Lord God Almighty, that all my days here on earth, I will fulfill that purpose, your purpose for my life. Help me through your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I have prayed. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen.